Hi everyone, this is uh, part two of me going through section B questions for the GCSE DT exam. So let's carry on where we left off. So this question here, this one is asking about uh, scales of manufacture. So this one, um, those of you that do business, and I know a lot of people do business, you need to really be careful about getting confused between the business terms and the business terminology and the product design. So the ones that might confuse you are the one-off um, or bespoke manufacturing. I think that is called job production in business. And I think mass production in business is called flow production. So just be careful about that. You can use the same knowledge and the same information, but just don't get confused. And also don't use business terms. Make sure you use the correct terms. So it says, explain why the two methods below are used to manufacture products in different volumes. Give specific examples, in, uh, examples of products in your answer. So the first one is mass production. This is what I wrote. Um, mass production is used to produce products in large numbers, um, for example, tens of thousands. Mass production is suited to products that can be made using highly automated machinery, such as injection molding and blow molding. So highly automated means uh, basically taken out of the hands of us, uh, humans, and basically done by robots and completely computer controlled. Has a lot of benefits uh, in terms of the cost of the production, the speed of the production, uh, the quality, but it's uh, expensive. So it's quite a high um, sort of initial cost, but then the unit cost for each product, if you're making thousands and thousands of them is low. So this will also ensure that all products are identical. So products such as toothbrushes and mobile phones, two rather random examples, but there we go, would be mass produced due to the demand. So that's important. So there needs to be enough demand for the products um, so you would not mass produce, for example, uh, T-shirts for Glastonbury because that might only be needed for a certain amount of time and for a certain amount of people. So it needs to be a product that everyone in the world or the country is going to need. So using mass production will reduce the cost of each product due to scales of economy and the speed of manufacture. So mass production, the important points to remember there are, there are it's highly automated, you can make identical products, the demand needs to be high, you benefit from a much quicker manufacture and you benefit from lower cost. Right, batch production. So batch production is used for smaller amounts of identical products. Examples of products made using batch production are t-shirts and also products that will go out of date. So for example, batches of bread rolls and cakes and things like that. So this method will include the use of templates and jigs to ensure products are made accurately. Now, this is important because obviously in this example, your stuff is going to be controlled by uh, CNC or computer numerically controlled or done by robots. But here you are going to have some human uh, input. So, for example, to make sure that the pieces of the T-shirts are cut out correctly, you may have a template that someone is going to be cutting around on the material. OK, so using things like templates and a jig, a jig is basically something, for example, if you had to drill a load of holes in a piece of wood and you wanted to make sure that they were all drilled in the correct place, you may have like something that you put over the top of the wood that has the holes in the right position and you drill through the, the jig, basically, and it makes sure that you can take this jig off and put it on the next bit of wood and the holes are going to be in the correct place. So the use of these are called production aids. OK, and they are used more in uh, sort of batch production, uh, not used in mass production because that's where all the computer controlled stuff comes in. And it wouldn't really make any sense to use them in one off because what's the point? You might use a template once or twice, maybe but you would normally use them where you're making, say, 100 of the same product. Batch production also allows the, manufacturer to, be, the manufacturer to be flexible as changes can be made to the design easily. So 
in mass production, if you're injection molding something, you have a mold, which has cost a lot of money to purchase and you're kind of uh, stuck making that one product. If you're using batch production, say you were making Glastonbury t-shirts and then you suddenly wanted to be making uh, Boardmasters t-shirts, you can change the design quite quickly. OK, because you've only got a small amount, you might just need to change a few templates here or there or alter something and off you go. So that's scales of production. Right. This is, I think, the 2021 um, section B. So let's have a look at this. It gives you this is quite a common question. Uh, table two shows a range of products. Again, notice that we've got all different types of material specialisms here. So we've got paper and board, we've got timber, metals, polymers, textiles, electronics. OK, so when you get something like this, make sure that you look ahead at what you're being asked before you pick the product, because it's asking you to um, name a specific main material, name a property of the material and describe why the property property is needed for the product to function properly. So actually, you could, if you were confident with the baseball bat or the screwdriver blade or the uh, even the cotton T-shirt, you go for it. Like if you if you could say something like, for example, uh, the T-shirt could be cotton. A property of the cotton is that it dyes easily. Um, that means you can colour it easily, change the colour to appeal to the user. OK, so that's a textiles answer, even though you're not a textile student. Ideally, you're going to want to choose this one. So my chosen product is the baby's drinking cup. Name the specific main material component for this because it might need to have slight flex on the little handles. You could do polypropylene or I would say hips again are two good options. So name one property of the material of your chosen product. For polypropylene, you might say it's fatigue resistant. For hips, you might say it's impact resistant. Um, get described why the property is needed for the product to function properly. Well, polypropylene, um, if the uh, when the lid is being put on and off, it's going to need to flex. So it needs to be resistant, resistant to like wear and tear. And the flex on the handles and the lid. Uh, obviously, I'm writing that really, really quickly for in for hips, high impact polystyrene. Um, if the child or the baby was to drop the cup, it's not going to smash or crack. So that could be an option to write down. But here um, you could also choose the baseball bat and you might say, well, it's made from ash because it's shock resistant, um, which means it can take the impact of the ball. So that would that would get you full marks. For the screwdriver blade, you could say it's made from tool steel. You could say that it's got good um, compressive strength or good torsional strength so that when you are um, screwing in a screw, it's not going to fracture or break. Or you could say it's got really good hardness, so it's not going to wear away when you're trying to use it. So with questions like this, if you see the polymer one and you think, oh, I've got no idea, Look at the others. And if you're not being asked to talk about fractional distillation or a manufacturing process, um, you can answer about a different material. OK. Right. Next question. Explain two ways materials can be stiffened. You may use examples in your answer. Uh, this is one that can catch you out because there are quite specific answers There's a specific bit in the book. It's right after the forces bit and it says, how can materials be reinforced and stiffened? Um, here are some of the examples you could put down. So materials can be laminated. So laminated just means to have layers like normally glued together. So, for example, plywood, um, you can layer it in multiple layers, which results in a very stiff material that would get you the mark. You could also say um, something like textile, such as polyester, can be woven, woven together, not woven, woven, which basically means like this. And that is called webbing, which has excellent tensile strength. So you see this in things like uh, seat belts in cars because it's got really good resistance to tensile uh, forces. 
You could also say that paper is laminated in a plastic pouch to protect it from tearing. So there's loads that you could do with this. I think that's literally what I've put here. I oh, know it's not. There's even another example here that I've put, which is um, cardboard can be folded and bent to increase its stiffness. So corrugated card has a folded inner layer that increases its stiffness. So in side corrugated card, you have that like fluted layer and that gives it really good um, sort of strength and resistance to impacts and things like that. So if you don't know a couple of those off the top of your head, you need to make sure that you have a look at those. Another table of um, exciting uh, products to have a look at. So um, this one is all about standard components. So rather than stock forms, which is all about like buying materials in planks or bars or sheets, these are like the bits and bobs that you need to manufacture products that you wouldn't necessarily make yourself. So all of you in your NEA is probably used some screws or maybe a hinge or uh, an LED or something like that. Those are called standard components and they you, you buy them in from somewhere else and there's reasons for that. So this question is, is asking you to complete just one row. So please make sure you read the question carefully because I can imagine some people filling in all of these rows and wasting time when actually it's just asking you to do one. So looking down here, the ones that obviously we're probably going to go for are these two. So this one is a hinge and it allows you to create uh, a component that will open and close. It's as easy as that, um, like, a, like a door or a box lid. I mean, ooh, the excitement here. And this one is a nut and bolt. So allows you to join materials together. Now, the important thing with a nut and bolt to mention is that it's not a permanent joining method. So you can you can take it apart in contrast to something like gluing. So that makes it quite useful. The other ones here, this one is like a, a fastener or a press stud for joining like a closing on fabric. Um, this one is a resistor. So it helps to protect components from too much current. So it helps to like control, control the, the current that goes around the circuit. Current, or is it voltage? I think it's current. Um, and then these ones are like split pins or paper fasteners. And they just join bits of paper together, don't they? So it's, it's not very complicated that, relatively easy one. I've given you all of the answers, but remember this one is only asking for one. Next question is a little bit, uh, is sort of linked to it. So explain the benefits of using standard components when manufacturing products. If lots of similar products are being used, then they can be bought in bulk and benefit from economies of scale. So that would get you uh, a good mark. So the cost would be lower. But also, if you think you're a manufacturer, say you make tables, it doesn't make any sense for you to make screws and um, like hinges and things like that, because you would need totally different types of machinery you would need to specialize in something that maybe you don't you don't actually specialize in you don't have the skill to do so the manufacturer doesn't need to invest in equipment to make their own standard components you can just buy them they can just buy a quality product and focus on their own product so when you buy a standard component it will have already gone through quality control checks so you know it's good to go as well as that if the consumer uh, was to lose one of the standard components, they can be easily replaced because they're standard. You can buy them all over the place. So, for example, the nut and bolt, they're quite often labelled M4, M6, M8, and you can buy these all over the world. It's a standard measurement. So relatively simple question, that one. But make sure you know what standard components are. Right, this is one that is asking you about manufacturing processes. Again, a very common question. And it's given you one, two, three, four, five, six different options this time, which is quite kind. The one that we want to go for is injection molding. OK, so similar to the question before, offset lithography is a, is a, a printing process. Turning, you could do wood turning and uh, centre lathe turning, metal turning. But I doubt anyone knows enough detail about that to get six marks. 
Casting would be for metals. I wouldn't pick that unless you've done it in your NEA and you really understand it. <coughs> Weaving is for textiles and flow soldering is for electronics. So injection molding is the one we want to go for. Now, these are the steps that you want to be talking about. A polymer stock form such as granules are fed into a hopper. We've already done this on the on the previous page, so I'm just going to talk you through it really, really quick. Obviously, you've got the motor again, you've got the Archimedes screw. An Archimedes screw pushes the polymer down the barrel of the machine. Obviously, you've got the heat coming in from both sides. Uh, the granules are heated and they soften. Then you need some kind of mould at the end of this, and I've drawn exactly the same mould again, I don't know why. Uh, the plastic is then injected into the mould under pressure, and the motor helps to, uh, to create that pressure. Remember that this process is for thermoplastics. Okay. Um, and once cooled, the mould separates and the part is ejected. So you should know that off by heart, you should be able to draw that diagram and write those steps really, really easily. Okay, so make sure you know those. Right, this one's, this one's a hard question. Don't like this one at all, because again, AQA are evil, okay? And they've made this sound much more complicated than it is. So remember, again, this exam is designed for lots of different types of students who might be focusing on different things. So this one is saying, choose one of the methods techniques shown in table five. Describe how your chosen method is used to ensure quality control. So we are going to go for dimensional accuracy. Process time is um, to do with electronics. It's to do with like how long you develop a PCB. It's like don't you don't need to know it. So process time, no, 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 no. Registration accuracy is all about printing. It's something to do with uh, uh, printing, like professional printing presses and things like that. So again, no, no, no. Dimensional accuracy is what we want to focus on. So I find this just a really confusing question. Dimensional accuracy ensures that products are manufactured within tolerance. OK, so remember, again, tolerance is measured in a plus or minus. It is an acceptable margin of error. OK, so anything to do with quality control, you can talk about tolerances. Very important in manufacturing. So, for example, the correct length, the correct width. This will result in less waste during the manufacturing process. A jig or template could be used to ensure dimensional accuracy. So like we spoke about earlier in one of the other questions, um, using a template to draw a shape over and over, say I was drawing something like this, you might um, like use a template to make sure that they were all correct and within tolerance. And also to help improve dimensional accuracy, the use of CAD and CAM, so something like a laser cutter, um, can also result in better dimensional accuracy as it is possible to achieve finer tolerances. Confusing question. Again, make sure you pick the thing that you can mildly talk something about. And um, if you see anything to do with quality control, tolerances is always a good thing to talk about. Right. This was in your mock, I believe. Um, you may have seen it in past papers. This is a beautiful question. Uh, it's eight marks. It says, before a consumer makes a product purchase, they should consider the six R's shown in table six. Analyze and evaluate how the six R's may help a consumer make an informed decision whether to purchase or not. So I'm gonna go through each of my paragraphs. So reduce, reducing the number of materials used. So say I was making a children's toy. If I use timbers and polymers and metals all fused together, that makes it quite difficult to take apart and recycle. So reducing the number of materials used in a product can help to minimise its environmental impact. If materials are mixed, it makes them difficult to recycle. Manufacturers could ensure that their products are made from one type of polymer. For example, HTPE detergent bottles. So the lid and the bottle all made from the same polymer, which means it can all be recycled in the same way. This makes the product easier to recycle and reduces the impact on the environment. 
A manufacturer could also reduce the amount of plastic used in their product by making certain sections hollow. So say you were making a plastic part that looked a bit like this for some reason. Oh, say you were doing like a joystick, you know, a really old fashioned joystick for like a gaming console or something. This part here, rather than making it solid plastic, um, could you make it sort of hollow on the inside? So a hollow center, reducing the amount of plastic that's used and maybe just have some little sort of struts or something in there that, that help to maintain the shape. Also just reduces the amount of, of plastic that needs to be uh, used in the product. Right, the next one that I've gone for then is um, refuse. So I've gone through literally all of them here. Some customers may refuse to purchase products that use finite materials. Many customers may decide not to purchase a new mobile phone due to the fact that many precious metals are used in its construction. So precious metals such as gold, uh, tantalum is used. There's loads that, is, that are used in smartphones. Um, these materials also come from unethical sources such as the Congo, where working conditions are very poor. If you've got any geography knowledge or science knowledge, bring it in at this point. I know I keep saying it, but you can get, you'll be surprised what you can bring in and what will get you marks. Right, reuse. Reusing products is an excellent way of reducing their environmental impact. Bags for life have reduced the amount of single use plastic waste generated from shopping bags. If a product can be reused and its life extended, this may encourage a customer to buy it over a single use product quite self-explanatory. And I've given an example there, which is good. Next one, repair. If a product cannot be repaired when broken, then it is likely to be disposed of. This causes a huge amount of waste with many products, uh, products ending up in landfill. Always talk about landfill with um, AQA. It's always on their mark schemes. So if in doubt, oh no, it's gonna end up in landfill, usually get you a mark. I've given some examples here. IKEA and Apple have recently introduced instructions that show their customers how to repair their products to extend their life. So Apple used to make it ridiculously hard for you to open your phone and actually repair components. And IKEA used to do the same because they would prefer that you threw away the old product and you bought a new one. But they got in a lot of trouble for that. So they have now issued instructions about how to repair their products and extend the life. Right, next one, recycled uh, materials or recycling. Consumers may not be happy to purchase a product if it cannot be recycled. Packaging materials that cannot be recycled can be very damaging to the environment. So I always use the example of polystyrene, the horrible white stuff that comes in uh, like packaging boxes. It normally has like hollow bits in it where a product fits into. Um, it can't be recycled. It's really damaging to the environment and may affect a consumer's decision. There are now much more environmentally friendly packaging options available, such as shredded paper and recyclable plastic pouches. So any of you that have got an Amazon pou um, package lately may have noticed that they started sending like these inflated um, sort of plastic pouches. They are LDPE, which is very easy to recycle um, because they've got air in them. They help to pack out the boxes, but then they can be popped and, and easily recycled. And the last one, rethink. Consumers are starting to rethink where products are sourced from and the impact of this. Many consumers may be more likely to purchase a product that has a lower carbon footprint. So for example, one that has been manufactured or sourced locally. I've gone, I've gone for fruit as a good example. So buying fruit that is being grown and harvested in the UK rather than South Africa would help combat CO2 production. So. Plenty in that question. I think that's a really nice question. Any questions about uh, sustainability are a winner because there's loads of stuff in the news. There's loads of stuff you can talk about. Right, these are now the last question. So this is from uh, last year's paper. So these questions came up last year. So unlikely to come up again, but good practice of some of the technique for answering these questions. This one's interesting. It says table one identifies specific processes used to remove different materials and make sure materials are cut to tolerance. So that's interesting. It's asking you about something very specific, making sure that things are cut to the right size. So choose a process, use notes and or sketches, describe the process in detail. 
We are not, I repeat, not going for turning. <clears throat> die cutting is used to cut out things like packaging nets and gift cards. So that is for papers and boards. Cutting by shearing, yes, can be used on metals and things like that, but it's a textiles process, really. So we're going for laser cutting again. So um, I've kind of explained a little bit about the process, but then focused on how the, pro the, the process can be controlled to make sure it cuts with intolerance. So laser cutting can be used to cut through different materials such as wood, polymers, card and fabrics. A CAD file must first be created to the correct size. Coral draw could be used. So you could do a little doodle of like a coral draw file and you could draw some sort of shapes and stuff on there, for example. A little toolbar or whatever. It says the line colour must be set correctly. So you should hopefully know that red cuts and black engraves. So, for example, if you did a little doodle, you could say that the red and then the inside is black. Um, if you don't set the line co uh, colour correctly, the product will not be, or the outcome will not be to a good quality or with intolerance. This is really important. The laser must then be focused. So if you almost imagine like, uh, like a magnifying glass, when the sun, you can kind of focus the, the rays. It's exactly the same as how a laser works. So imagine this is the laser cutter. I might as well draw it over here for you. The light is kind of focused down and it needs to come to a point right where the material is. So that's the light and that's the perfect sort of cutting distance. If the material is too close to the laser, it might not have come to a point. And if it's too far away, it might like go past its point and then spread out again. So this can cause burning and all sorts of problems and it would not get you an accurate cut. And the last thing that you need to make sure that you do with laser cutting is turn the extraction on. If you don't turn the extraction on, um, all of the smoke that builds up inside the laser cutter can affect the quality of the cut and the accuracy of the cut. OK, so my doodles are absolutely terrible here, but um, it helps to explain the sort of uh, process a little bit. Right. Another one about forces. So remember, our forces are tension, compression. See if you can think of them before I even put them down. Uh, torsion, uh, shear, bending. Any others? I think those are the main ones, aren't they? So it's saying describe what forces are acting on the bow and arrow in figure three before it's fired. So I would say that we've got we've got tension here. We've got bending in the bow. And before this is released, we've got uh, like compression here as the arrow is being compressed. So the string of the bow is under tension. The arrow is being compressed until it's released and the bow is bending. So that would give you the marks, the three marks here. Make sure you don't start talking about things like gravity and mass and weight. OK, you need to make sure that you're talking about these specific forces. Right. This one here is another one about how materials can be reinforced or stiffened was a question earlier on. I think it was in video one or it might have just been in this video, but there are specific ways. So the ones that I've put here, materials can be reinforced by being laminated. So thin layers of wood can be layered together to produce a material with better resistance to bending, like, for example, plywood. Um, and I've given another example here. Uh, paper and card can be laminated in a polymer pouch to increase its resistance to tearing. Really easy. That would get you the full marks. So specific ways of how things are reinforced. Important that you know those. Okie okay, dokie. Explain the purpose of a template. So we've spoken a little bit about templates, about how it might be the shape of, for example, like a T-shirt or something like that. And why, why would you bother to use a template in the first place? So a template is used in batch production to produce multiple identical shapes and a worker would use a template to cut or draw around. It's only a two mark question. OK, remember that they're used in batch production because at this point there are more there are more humans involved. The use of a template helps to reduce the human error. It helps also to speed things up so it speeds up. Um, the template that you use might be made from a plastic or a metal, especially if it's being used multiple times. But that's basically what a template. Lots of you will have used templates in your NEAs. 
you may have laser cut a template. Um, that's that's what this is referring to. OK. Right. This question. Explain how the two factors given below would be considered when selecting materials or components. Availability. So I have focused on um, things like the, the lack of like microchips that are available at the moment. So there's called a chip shortage. So the availability of materials can be affected by many factors, including political issues, climate change and demand. So during the pandemic, there was a huge demand for like building materials. Everyone was going crazy and building, making home improvements and all that sort of stuff. So there was a big problem with the lack of uh, woods, timbers, building stuff. Um, there is still an issue with uh, microchips, lack of ability of microchips or not no availability. Um, and also there is a global shortage of sand, believe it or not, which is used for building and construction for cement. Um, so you need to carefully consider the availability of materials. And if there's political issues in a certain country, so for example, in maybe Iraq, where we get a lot of oil from, that can cause issues with the availability of that material. OK, so it's important that manufacturers select materials and components that are ready av readily available or their production of their product could be slowed down significantly. This can be seen in the low availability of silicon in microchips and the effect this has had on electrical products over the last few years. So you could not get a PS5 or an Xbox Series X literally anywhere. You couldn't get them. You couldn't get the new graphics cards. You couldn't get the latest, um, you know, electronic goods because there's literally no microchips available. So lots of manufacturers made the decision to use older graphics cards or older chips so that they didn't have to make brand new ones because there was a shortage. So the availability of materials is very, very important. Um, right, now we're looking at the cultural and social factors. So social factors must be carefully considered when selecting materials. This one's important for all of our, um, our uh, you know, like uh, people who are vegan and people who just are very conscious of the effect that um, materials can have on animals. The use of animal products may offend some consumers, um, you know, like the use of leather and fur and things like that. Products that are tested on animals could also affect the popularity of the product. So cosmetics and things like that that are tested on animals, um, you know, that can be it should be a major issue for everyone. But it's um, it can be a major issue for the manufacturer because it may reduce the popularity of the product. And more than ever, People want to know where materials are coming from. So this is a great example. Um, it's like I can't remember, the logo is like something like this FSC and it's like a tick or something. I can't remember what it, exactly what it looks like. But FSC means uh, the Forest Stewardship Council. And if you see any card or paper or wood that has the FSC forest logo on it, it basically means that it's come from a sustainably managed forest. So it's not like the rainforest that is just being chopped down at a horrendous rate. This forest is if a certain amount of wood is harvested or chopped down felled, then that wood is replenished and the forest is given time to actually recover. Um, so that's what FSC sort of stands for. Another eight marker. Woo! And this one again is on sustainability issues. So fingers crossed this comes up again, but this one is all about carbon dioxide. This is literally a life cycle assessment question. OK, so this one is saying analyze and evaluate what factors contribute to carbon release or carbon footprint from raw material source to final disposal. So thinking about that sort of circle of what happens during a product's life and how carbon is generated at, at each sort of stage. So it's analyze and evaluate. And in the mark scheme, it actually says if you give suggestions of how the um, the impact can be reduced, you can get marks for that as well. So I've written quite a lot for this question just to give you an idea of what the kind of things I would put into it. You wouldn't need to write quite as much as this, but I thought this might be helpful. So. Little bit of an intro, not massively necessary, but just help me to get started. 
To understand a product's carbon footprint, a product life cycle assessment can be carried out. You'd probably get a mark for saying product life cycle assessment. During extraction of raw materials, large amounts of fossil fuels are burnt to generate the power needed. This could be to process the raw materials into their usable forms, and I've given the example of fractional distillation, or power the machinery being used, for example, the drills being used to drill into the seabed to extract crude oil. So that's extraction. Now I'm thinking about production. Materials such as polymers are then manufactured into various products using processes such as injection molding and extrusion. A large amount of heat is needed during these processes, generating more CO2. This can be reduced through the use of renewable energy, such as solar panels on the roof of the factory. And lots of factories now are trying to harness renewable energy to offset the carbon footprint of their business. Right, uh, these last few paragraphs. <coughs> Products then need to be transported around the world. So this is all about transport. This is usually done by air, road or boat, and all of these require fossil fuels. So here we go. Here's me talking about how it can be offset. Many companies have started to use biodiesel to offset the product miles, good term there, created by their products. During a product's use, more CO2 can be produced. So a car will burn fossil fuels during its use. And things like kettles can be overfilled, which can use too much energy to heat water. So manufacturers must ensure that their products are energy efficient to reduce the carbon footprint um, during their use. And here we go, the, the, the final step here. During disposal, many products can be difficult to separate and therefore recycle. Believe it or not, I've seen lots of articles that suggest that glass is less environmentally friendly than plastic because it takes a huge amount of energy. I think the glass has to be heated over 3000 degrees to actually recycle it back into another product. So manufacturers should consider whether or not their products could be upcycled or reused to extend their life and reduce the need for more CO2 emissions. Right, bosh, that's all of the section C, uh, not C, sorry, section B questions I could find. So if you've stuck with me all the way through to the end, well done. I'm going to do a video about Section C questions. Uh, thanks for watching. See you on the next video.